If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews today. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is going to be our text. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I want to speak to you today on this subject, the danger of drifting. The danger of drifting. Therefore, we, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Let's pray together. Father, we tend to wonder. The song rightly says it about us. We'd leave the God we love. Were it not for your grace and mercy, the presence of your Spirit in our lives, the convicting power of the Word of God, we would leave. But Father, we thank you that you've given us your Word, such a great salvation, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we live in a culture that has drifted away from the truth of the Scriptures drifted away from the morality of our founding fathers. But Father, more than anything, we have drifted away from Christ. We've drifted away from Jesus. May we cling to Christ. May His Word ring in our ears and challenge us each day of our lives. Father, help us to not drift. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I grew up in the, area, the era of watching the reruns of Andy Griffith. Anybody watch the Andy Griffith show a lot? I watched that, and I watched the Beverly Hillbillies, all of those old shows, and I love those old shows. I still like to watch those, and I was thinking about the shows that are on today, and I don't watch too many. I like to watch a lot of sports and things like that, but I don't really watch the sitcoms so much, but I think there is a big difference between what we saw in the days of Andy and Barney, Ozzie and Harriet, the Cleavers, and Jed and Ellie Mae to what we have today. And I thought about this, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this. I never saw an episode of the Andy Griffith Show where Andy or Barney were in bed with their girlfriends. They, they didn't live with their girlfriends prior to marriage. They never talked about same-sex marriage. They never talked about abortion or any of those things. It was wholesome country living. And then as we think about what we see today, we know that all of those things that Andy and Barney never talked about, are celebrated. They're laughed at. Now, how did we get from Ozzie and Harriet to the Simpsons? We didn't get there overnight. We drifted there, didn't we? It was a subtle drift, a subtle shift in our culture. Our founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence. They gave us the Constitution of the United States. We believe that those documents hold the key to a great nation. But I would say that many of us would believe that the intent of the Founding Fathers has been drifted away from, and the things that are upheld today by the Constitution are not the original intent of our Founding Fathers. Now, how did we get from where we were in the late 1700s to where we are today? We drifted. It didn't turn all at once. It moved gradually over a course of time. Now, those things concern me, but let me tell you what concerns me more. It concerns me that we live in a culture that has shifted away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me share three terms with you, and I'm going to explain what these three terms mean. Pre-modernism, modernism, and then post-modernism. Now, those are big words. We talk about them in theological circles, but I will explain them. Pre-modernism came in our nation and around the world 100, 150 years ago. And here's what pre-modernism was all about. It was the idea that there were stated truths that people just accepted because they were stated truths. For instance, the Bible. It declared the truths of the Word of God. And they were accepted by the masses because God said so. And then we shifted from pre-modernism to modern thought. Modern thought says, okay, you tell us that there are truths that are absolutes, but why? What makes them absolutes? We need to understand what makes these things what they are. So they began to question 
this kind of thinking. They began to question the absolutes that their forefathers had believed and held to be true. We live in a postmodern world. Postmodernism says, well, we can't know that it's true. Really, truth is relative. What's true to me is right, and what's true to you is right. There are no absolutes. There are no accepted truths. Do you see how we shifted as a nation? That's the culture that we live in, and because of that, we now live in a culture where we have been given the Word of God to proclaim boldly. We hold it to be true. We have the convictions of the Holy Spirit to charge us and to challenge us. These are the accepted truths of the Word of God to us, but they're not to the world because the world has drifted. But I wonder, are they the accepted truths of the church of the living God? You see, I believe that while our founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, had principles, and those that heard him had principles, and those that heard them had principles, over a period of time, we have shifted. We no longer live in a culture that accepts readily these truths. They no longer accept the truth of the Word of God. But we must not drift away, friends. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ must not drift away from the truth of the gospel. We must adhere to it, hold to it. You know, they say that change is good, but it's not always good. They say that change is inevitable. But we should make sure that we do not deter or move away from the stated truths. We do not change the message that God has given us in the Scriptures. We need to hold to it with every fiber of our being. Now, we would like to think that the times are a lot different than they were back then. But in the first century, the folks to whom the writer of Hebrews wrote, they were struggling with the temptation to drift away. You see, they were a unique people group. They are Hebrew in their thinking because they are Hebrew in their ancestry. And they're spread all over the Greco-Roman world. They live in different nations. And they were written to by an unknown writer. We don't know exactly who it was. But we know the Holy Spirit was giving them this word. And they needed it because they were facing the temptation to drift. And let me tell you why. Because they were Hebrew, they were facing the ostracism in their Jewish communities throughout the world. They were being told, we don't believe in this Messiah, Jesus Christ. He cannot be the Son of God. We believe in one God. They couldn't understand the idea of the Trinity. They couldn't understand the idea of a dying Messiah that rose again on the third day. So they rejected that. And if you were a Hebrew Christian in the first century, you were pressured all the more to leave behind this Jesus, to go away from that. And they were saying, well, we could accept that he was a man that lived. We could accept that he was a man that taught. But we cannot accept that he's the Messiah. Would you stay with us? We're Hebrew people. Let's remember our God. So they were tempted to do that. And they were also tempted to reject Christ because they lived in the Roman world. And persecution was being ramped up more and more all the time. So there was a temptation to say that Caesar is Lord when they wanted to say that Jesus is Lord. So there was pressure on them to leave behind the stated truths that they had been given. And friends, the culture that we live in has really not changed. There is temptation after temptation, pressure after pressure in the culture that we live in to drift away from the accepted truths of the Bible. So we're going to look at that today. This is really a timely book, just like all the other books of the Bible. Have you ever noticed that? Have you noticed how the Bible is timeless? Some people would say, well, I can't believe a 2,000-year-old book. Well, let me say this to you. That 2,000-year-old book hits the nail on the head of every culture that has ever been. You know why? Because of what we learned in the catechism just a few minutes ago. We are fallen mankind. We really haven't changed. We have a desire to do our own thing. We follow our own way like our original father, Adam. So times really haven't changed. So they had a temptation to drift. We have a temptation to drift. Now, what I want to do for us this morning is look at three challenges that face people regarding the danger of drifting. First of all, we need to watch where we are going. They had to watch where they're going. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Now, notice the word therefore. The old adage that they always say is, when you see the word therefore, you need to look at it because we want to know what it's there for. 
Chapter 1, the introduction of the book of Hebrews, is one of the great chapters in all the Bible. It declares the surpassing excellence of Christ over all. Look at verses 1 through 4. Let me read them for you there just to get a sense of how great this section was. Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purifications for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Here's what the writer of Hebrews did when I shared this with my congregation. He began the book not with a mystery, but with a conclusion. This is Christ. It's as though he began the sentence, not with the exclamation point at the end of the sentence, but at the beginning. Because there was such a temptation to drift away from Christ, he wanted to make sure that they knew this is what this letter is all about. It's all about this wonderful Jesus that we serve, this wonderful Jesus that we have heard about. Therefore, now we come to chapter 2. We come to the crux of the matter. What are we going to do with what we have learned about the Lord Jesus Christ. They needed to watch where they were going. They needed to pay close attention to what they had heard. Some of your translations, if you have the older English translations like the KJV or the NKJV, it will say, we need to take heed to what we have heard, to give earnest heed, to pay attention, to lock our eyes upon it, to look closely, to give close attention to what we have heard. They had been told the truth about Jesus Christ. That's how the church was formed. They had heard the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had, had men to come and share with them the declaration of truth. They weren't to let that slip through their fingers. They had to lock onto it and pay attention to that. They needed to be careful, notice here, not to drift away. Here's the picture that the writer's trying to give us. It's a picture of a ship that's coming to a harbor. It's a picture of a ship that has a destination point that it's locked onto. But because of not paying attention, they drift off course. Now this is not the idea of a ship that's out on the sea that's violently being knocked about and a ship's captain who's trying to hold it on course. It's not that at all. It's the idea that they know where they're going. And then there's a subtle temptation here to just lose their way, to drift off course, to get off line to be allowed to slip away. Some writer said it was like a line, a wedding ring to slip off your finger. Maybe you lose some weight and your ring doesn't fit and someday you come home and your ring has fallen off and you don't even realize that. It didn't happen all at once. You say, well, I, I slipped off my finger all at once, but your, the size of your finger did not change all at once. It happened over a course of time. That's what it's talking about here. He's saying be careful that you do not drift away the subtle inclination to move away from what we have been told about the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, did you know that there's always a danger that we can drift? I get kidded a lot at home because I'm not a very good driver. I just believe that if somebody's in the back seat and they're talking to you, I was always taught that you're supposed to turn around and look at people in the eye and talk to them whenever you're driving. So I do that. So I'm known as a drifter. I drift from one side to the other. Did you know that somebody somewhere knew how I drove. And so they have made a way that they have cut these little grooves in the side of the road so that when you hit them, it goes brrrr. You know what that's all about? They've even put them in the middle of the road for me because I have a temptation to drift. The writer here is, in a sense, taking you across those grooves and saying, you're drifting, come back. Come back to the middle where you're supposed to be. Lock yourself on your destination, on your goal. Look to Christ. The writer of Hebrews here is putting the emphasis upon the person and work of Christ. There was a temptation for them to, to drift away, for Hebrew-thinking people to say, you know, it would just be so much easier if we just toned down the Jesus stuff. And we could still kind of hold to it a little bit, but we'll, we'll just kind of ease away. We'll appease our Jewish brethren. We'll not push it so much. We'll definitely not do anything that will caused the ire of Rome to be upon us. So they had a temptation to drift away. Friends, that's our culture today. 
Our culture says to the church, you know, you just need to back off a little bit on the Jesus stuff, on the sin stuff, all the things that he does, all, he, all the things he's taught, all the truths that we have held to. Do we realize that we've drifted? How many of you remember a few years ago when Coca-Cola changed its formula and the can and the name and everything? Anybody remember that? I mean, they did it like overnight. Overnight, you went from having Coca-Cola, something you'd had all your life, to having Coke. The can was different. And you opened it up, and the flavor was different. And you know what the people did when they made that? There was a public outcry. We want Coca-Cola. We don't want this Coke. It was terrible. They changed it overnight, didn't they? They didn't subtly move it just a little bit, change the can just a little bit. All of a sudden, you just had Coke, and Coca-Cola was no more. Friends, I want you to understand, the devil doesn't work like Coke. He doesn't just all of a sudden cut it and change it. No, he is he is in the church, caused us to drift away so slowly and so subtly that we often don't even realize that. We've moved away from the gospel, not in a drastic way, but we've allowed ourselves to drift off course. We see it a lot in our culture today, don't we? A gradual shift away from what the Bible says. A man from a few generations back, Richard Niebuhr, wrote this. This is what we have today, he says. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Friends, that's what we have today. We have a watered-down gospel that is no gospel at all, that cannot save. We have a works-based, oriented culture that is very, very religious, but not very gospel-centered. We've drifted away from the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't watch... We can lose our hold on the gospel, so we need to watch. How about you? Are you going to watch where you're going? Have you drifted away from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? A lot of times we have knowledge of the gospel. We know a lot of things about the truth of the gospel, but we're not applying those to our life. They're just things that we know. Friends, it's not just what we know. It's who we are. We're all about Christ. You may be drifting away from what you know. Now, here's the second truth today. We need to be warned about the danger. Look at verse 2 and part of verse 3. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Friends, this danger of drifting, it matters. It has an impact upon lives. It has an impact upon your life and on the lives of others. So here the writer gives us an argument from the lesser to the greater. Here's what I mean. First of all, he starts out with the message angels declared. Angels had delivered the law of God. There are references in the Bible, in the Old Testament, here in the New. By the way, the New Testament sheds wonderful light on what the Old Testament says. There are times in that Old Testament where it says that the message of the law, God's law, was given through angels to Moses and to the prophets. They were the ones who brought the message. They are heralds of the message of God. In this case, it's the message of the law. They help deliver the message of the law. And he says here that every sin against God's law will be punished. Notice here what it says. The message was declared by angels. It proved to be reliable. In other words, trustworthy, steadfast. It is the word of God. And he says, because it was, every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. What does he mean when he's talking about every transgression or disobedience? What word would we use to describe what that is? It's sin, right? Every sin, transgression, going against the law of God, going beyond what God has said, not doing what God has told us to do, all of those things. We would say sins of omission, things that we don't do that we ought to. Sins of commission, things that we do that we're not supposed to do. Any sin. What he's saying here was that when they broke the law of God, they were punished. Let me give you some Old Testament examples of that. I want you to think about two sets of priests' sons, Hophni and Phinehas, Nadab and Abihu. Do you remember those guys? The sons of Eli and the sons of Aaron. Do you remember how they violated the law of God? Do you remember what happened to them? God killed them, right? That was just retribution here. Punishment, that word means. How about others? How about many kings that were deposed? Why? Because they opposed the law of God. They broke the law of God. How about an entire nation in the north and then later in the south? What did they do? 
They violated the law of God. What happened to them? They were exiled. They were disbanded as a nation. Why? Because they opposed the law of God. They were justly punished. How about David when he sinned with Bathsheba? The sword never departed from his house. How about Solomon when he chased after false gods? He had all of that retribution that went against him. When God's people violated the law of God, they were punished. Now I want you to notice now the argument from the lesser. If God's going to punish those who break his law, how much more we who have a greater revelation in Christ? Rejecting the truth of Christ would surely be punished. How much more, he says. What a statement. Verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, the idea of neglect here is the idea of rejection. It's the idea of dismissing. It's the idea of not thinking much of something, just neglecting it, leaving it to be of no account in our life at all. What he's saying here to the people of of the Hebrew letter, he's saying, if our forefathers were justly punished when they broke the law of God, How much more if we neglect this great salvation, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? If we just, ah, it's not much. Ah, we can just turn away from that. Oh, well, it matters a little, but not a lot. Friends, it is dangerous. We need to be warned of the danger of neglecting so great a salvation. It is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a rhetorical question here. Is there any hope for the person that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ? No, there's not. If God punished sin in the Old Testament when they violated His commandments, how much more the greater revelation of the salvation that we find in Christ, who is the fullness of the Old Testament, who is the glory of God personified that we saw on earth, lived out, and the and the crucified Lord, and raised on the third day for our sins. If we reject that, is there any hope for us? No. Friends, the church has drifted so much off center that words of warning are just cast aside. It's it's like it doesn't even matter anymore. It's met with scorn and laughter and sometimes contempt. They hate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, we live in a culture that has skewed the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't even ring a bell with most churches. It doesn't even ring a bell when most people try to live it out. Let me give you an example of that from the Old Testament. There were two guys that left Ur of the Chaldees and came to the Promised Land. Now, one of them is Abraham, and we know about him, right? But did you know that he wasn't alone when he came? He brought with him his nephew Lot. Now, this is what the Bible says about him. Not what I would say, but the Bible says in the New Testament about Lot that he was righteous. You know what that means? It doesn't mean he was a great guy. It really means that he believed in the God of Abraham. So he's considered righteous. He was a believer. So he travels with Abraham to the Promised Land, and they go down into Egypt. You know about that. Well, when they were down there, they came back, and their herds were too large, and the land couldn't hold them all. So Abraham, being a a wonderful man, said to him, you know, Lot, we're brothers. You know, we're family, we're kindred. We shouldn't be arguing like this. He said, the whole land is before you. You go wherever you want to go, but the direction you go, you go, and I'll go the opposite way. And that was Abraham's land, but he was gracious to Lot. And the Bible says that Lot looked upon the land, and he saw the plain of Jordan. It was watered like the gardens of Egypt. Man, it was a great place. If you're a farmer... It was an agricultural dream. I can identify with that. I'm a farmer at heart. So he wanted that land. But the problem was Sodom and Gomorrah were in those areas. And everybody knew how wicked they were. They knew. But the Bible says that Lot chose that land, and he pitched his tent toward Sodom. In other words, he began to move that direction, drifting. Well, as the story goes on, you find that not only is he living toward Sodom, he is living In Sodom, he has drifted from the point where he's no longer a nomad out with his flocks. He is in that city. He is living in that place. Wicked, sinful, idolatrous. They gave sin a whole new description. And then later on in the story, you find out not only has he moved towards Sodom, not only has he moved into Sodom, but he is a key member of the city of Sodom. 
Now, do you know the story? Sodom was a wicked city. God visited Abraham. He had two angelic beings with him. Here they are doing the work of God again. And those angelic beings were there, and God said to them, Should I not tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And so he began to proceed to tell what he was about to do. You know what he was going to do? He was going to go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they were so wicked. You know that whole interchange between Abraham and God. That Abraham begged God, don't, don't take them. If there are a few righteous, they got down to the point that there wasn't enough righteous. So the angelic beings went down there. They came into the city. Lot saw them there. He knew everything about that city. He knew what was about to happen to those angels. So he gathered them up, took them into his house. They said to him, look, God sent us to destroy this city. Judgment's about to fall. You better get out of here. And if you have anybody you care about, you better gather them up and take them with you and get out. This place is about to go down. Remember what the Bible says he did? He went out and found his sons-in-law to be. The two men that were going to marry his daughters. And what did he do? He declared the gospel to them. Did you know that? He said, God is about to destroy this city. We better flee. Get out of here. You know what the Bible says? They thought he was joking. They thought he was joking. They didn't pay any attention to him. You know why? Because he had drifted. He had drifted from that point where he was with Abraham, a righteous man. He was on his own. He had moved towards Sodom. He had moved into Sodom. He had accepted everything that Sodom accepted. And when it came crunch time, his witness was gone. Friends, I believe Lot is symptomatic of the church of Jesus Christ today. We have more Lot than we do Abraham. That when the church doesn't proclaim the hope of the gospel, the fleeing the wrath to come then someday people aren't going to pay any attention to us because we've drifted away from the gospel. Friends, if we get off center, we need to be warned about the danger to come. There's a third thing we need to see in this text. We need to remember the witness of the truth of the gospel. Look at the second part of verse 3 and verse 4. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. What these Hebrew people needed to do was to remain anchored to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's described for them here, right? It was first delivered by the Lord. Friends, Jesus Christ came proclaiming the gospel. You remember one time, Brother Randall, you had a teacher in school that made the statement that Jesus never said that people ought to repent. But he surely did. That was the gospel, to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus declared the truth concerning himself. He came preaching the words of the kingdom. He came fulfilling the Old, Te fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures. He is the fulfillment of Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 53. He is indeed the one the scriptures spoke about. And he said as much. He came declaring the truth. It says that right here. It says, it was declared at first by the Lord. Then it was attested to us. That's why most people believe that Paul didn't write this, because this seems to be a man who heard the message somewhere else. Well, where? It says, it was attested to us by those who heard. Now, who are these? Well, these are the apostles and those who were with Jesus. The ones who heard what Jesus had to say. It was attested to us. These later believers, this writer of Hebrews is saying, I'm one of you. I heard the message just like you did. It came from the Lord to these men. It's been declared to us. They have confirmed it, the eyewitnesses, that Jesus is the Christ. It has been proclaimed boldly. We have believed that Jesus is who the Bible says he is. They testified of the validity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then if that wasn't enough, God gave them a third thing. He gave them signs and wonders, the evidence of the power of of the Holy Spirit. The apostles spoke the word of God, but they also were able to do these amazing things. Why? To somehow point to these men and say what great men they were? No. But to authenticate the power of the message that they shared, just like Jesus. What was the purpose of Jesus' signs and wonders? Was it so that he would do more signs and wonders? You ever wondered about this? When pressed, Jesus would not perform a miracle. Did you know that? Today we have a lot of folks say, well, we need to see more miracles. No, we need more gospel. I believe the greatest miracle 
is whenever God takes a wretched sinner that's dead in his sins and trespasses and gives him life and desire to repent and believe upon Christ and makes him a new creature. That's a miracle, right? But God gave them those signs and wonders. As if the message weren't enough, he authenticated it by the power of his Holy Spirit. So what we have here is a message of salvation that they were not to neglect. The witness of the gospel. They couldn't turn away from that. They had to hang on to that. It was the message of hope. And friends, I want you to know today, it is the message of hope that we must not neglect. We must not deter from the gospel. We have to remember the witness that we have in the Bible. It is our anchor. John Phillips, a writer, said this, and I quote, God's word is the anchor that secures our salvation, and it is the rudder by which we safely steer the ship of our souls. Friends, we have to hang on to the Word of God. You know how little emphasis there is today on the Word of God in most churches? It's an afterthought. The gospel is an afterthought. The ministries and programs, they're, forefront, they're at the forefront. I was driving through Lake Worth yesterday, and I saw a sign on a church that said, Where you're, you're what matters here. It's all about you here. How about it's all about God here? We want to make it all about God, right? It's a message of hope that we need not neglect. When we forget the Word of God, we go adrift. Paul wrote to different preacher boys, and he wrote some very famous words to one of his preacher boys, Timothy. He lived in this same time frame when people were drifting away from the gospel. Listen to what he said to him. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, here's the message of the Scriptures. And this is what he said to him. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful. Do you hear that? In all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You know what he was saying to him? The same thing the writer of Hebrews is saying to us today. Don't drift. Keep your course set. The Word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. They're saying the same thing. We need to hold true to the Word of God, the witness of the Scriptures. Friends, anytime we don't have a proper emphasis upon the Word of God, upon the Gospel, we're going to drift. We're going to find ourselves in danger. It seems the church today wants to do everything but present the message of salvation that we find in the Bible, in an era of drifting, we have to find ourselves holding on to the truth. We need to hear the urgency of this passage of Scripture. What do we need to do to keep ourselves from drifting? We need to listen to the warning. We don't need to neglect. We need to be watching ourselves. We have to hang on to the witness. Now let me give you three things by way of application before I close. Why must we pay such close attention to the tendency to drift away. Three things. First of all, because it is easy and natural to drift. It's easy. It's the convenient thing to do. It's the less costly thing to do. Let me tell you, if you're going to be a church that stands on the Word of God, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a piece of cake. It's not going to be a walk in the park. Standing on the truth of the gospel is not an easy thing. It's not easy for folks. Remember what Jesus said about the easy way? He said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus said, it's hard. That word meant filled with affliction. It's tough. He didn't say it's an easy path. He said, deny yourself and take up the cross. Does that sound easy to you? It's not. It's not easy in our culture. Not a lot of smooth sailing in that narrow way, is there? You want the easy way? You have to drift away from that. But let me say also, 
Did you know it's natural for us to drift away? We are naturally drifters. We don't hold on to the truth because it's our nature. And he said, well, now, preacher, I thought we have a new nature. You do. But you have your old unredeemed flesh that wants to battle and fight against that redeemed flesh, that right desire. You have wrong desires. And whenever it's easy to drift away, the natural tendency will be to do just that, to follow the crowd, to go like everybody else is going. Let me give you an, an illustration of that. You say, well, man, we'd like to reach more people for Jesus. Well, we got some methodology for you. we got some things that will work. And they're easy. If you'll follow these easy steps, you will grow your church. Well, that looks good. And these are sincere brothers and sisters. They're, they're trying hard, but they're way off base because they're not fixed on the hope of the gospel. They're fixed on methodology. And their mindset is different. They're all about numbers. They're all about uh, being able to say, well, now we did this and we did that. You know how easy it is to drift away into that? It's a natural thing to do. There are a lot of well-meaning ch children of God. Listen to me now. I'm not saying that everybody does that. It's wicked and idolatrous. I'm saying that they are following their natural course. They're doing what the world would do. They're saying, well, you know, we're trying to do the right thing, but what they've done is they've taken their eyes off the hope of the gospel. It is easy and natural to drift. Here's the second thing. Because we can be distracted and deceived. I kind of already let in a little bit of that. Let me flesh that out just a little bit more. The devil is very, very clever. He walked in here today, and he had all of his guns blazing. We would see that, and we would take heed, would we not? That's not how he works. He works differently in the life of the body today. He realizes that if this message of the gospel goes out, people are going to hear and they're going to believe because God's word does not return void. So what should he do? He's going to distract us. He's going to get us off course. He's going to fill us with all kinds of busy work, all kinds of things to do in quote-unquote ministry that don't have anything to do at all with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, there's a lot of things you can do to be busy in ministry. And don't get me wrong, I think these things are important. You can work in all the soup kitchens and clothing closets. Those are good things. But that's not the gospel. Those are things that help authenticate our love for people, but they're not the gospel. You can get caught up in all the other programs and ministries of a local church. Satan has failed churches with all kinds of things that distract them. And here's where the deception comes in. We get real busy in those things. We're doing a lot of stuff for the Lord. We begin to think, man, I'm really serving Jesus. Meanwhile, the gospel's never on our lips. We're not praying for the lost. We're not sending out missionaries. We're not supporting missionaries. We are as busy as busy can be. Friends, I want you to know the church of the living God is tired because it's been doing so much ministry. You know why I think we're tired? Because I think we've been fighting against our Savior. I don't think we've been doing what the Savior's called us to do. What did he tell us to do? Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. He didn't say, go Christianize the culture. He didn't say that. He didn't say, go in and change nations. This is how you do it. That's not what he said. Friends, we want to see America change. I do. I care about that. How will America be changed when we're not so deceived that we don't realize that the only hope for America is salvation in Jesus Christ? You cannot. You cannot legislate morality. You can't protest enough. You can't do enough things to change a culture. The gospel changes a culture. Don't be deceived, church. Don't be deceived by your busyness and all the things that we can do. We don't want to detract from the greatness of Christ. Here's the third application. Why do we need to pay attention to these things? Because it is a matter of spiritual life and death. Now the devil, back to that deception, he would like for you to believe that, well, you know, we're just all trying to get along and we're all trying to do our Christian thing and that's what really matters. We're just good people trying to do that. Friends, I want you to understand something. When somebody drifts away from the truth of Jesus Christ, when that drift occurs over a period of time, here's what happens. Whole nations lose the gospel. I'm going to be going to Scotland two weeks from the day. And I want you to know a nation where the great reformer John Knox thundered the gospel and literally changed that entire nation where the queen was afraid of his prayers is now a place where they don't even begin to claim to be Christian. I was there two years ago. 
and I tried to pass out the gospel of John, here's the response I'd get. Atheist, no thank you, don't want it, never. I mean, you name it, I heard it. I went and talked to ladies. We did some door-to-door, door knocking, and they, they, this lady said to me, you don't believe that, that what you're saying is really true, do you? turned out this lady was a member of a church and she went every Sunday, but she didn't believe the word of God. Friends, I want you to know our nation is right behind them. We're right behind them because we are drifting away and we don't realize these things are a matter of spiritual life and death. Listen to what Jesus said. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Friends, we don't want to Christianize America. We want to gospelize America. We want to declare the truth of the living God, that Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and the life. And no man, no man comes to the Father. And let me get back to this knowledge thing again. A lot of people can claim a lot of knowledge. They know the truth of the gospel, but they've drifted away from it. You see, they haven't taken it as their hope. They've not locked onto it. No, they've drifted away. You see, there's eternal implications even for many that profess Christ, many that have been through baptismal waters, many, many who are on the roll of a church. They have all the knowledge, but they've drifted away. And let me say this to you, and you need to be warned more than any. There are many who have heard the gospel week after week after week in local churches, and their heart and their mind is not there, and they are calloused over and seared over because they have a place in a pew or on a church roll. You need to be warned. You're hearing it once again. Who knows? Today may be the day when you break away for good. Don't drift away. You ever been on a trip and set your GPS for a destination? It begins to talk to you. Now, don't get mad at this. I'm just making an observation. You ever notice that it's always a woman's voice on there? I mean, come on now. My wife... She, she likes to tell me how to drive and all this and that. And I'm a man. We're not good at asking directions, so I'm an equal opportunity insulter here, right? But if you notice how that, you'll take a turn here and it'll say, well, now go down here and turn there. You, you know what, do that. And then if you just keep turning the wrong way, what does it finally tell you? It'll stop for just a second, and then you'll hear it say that word. Remember, what does it say? Recalculating. Recalculating. Why? Because you've gotten so far off course that there's no turns. It has to step back and say, okay, this is the way you need to go. Friends, I believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has taken some wrong turns. We've drifted here, and we've drifted there. And now I believe the Word of God is telling us, recalculate, church. Fix your eyes upon Christ upon the hope of the gospel, proclaim the glory of God, the salvation of souls in Christ and Christ alone. That's the hope. Friends, the church needs to recalculate. Sometimes I need to recalculate. Man, I was just lying awake last night just thinking about how easy it is for me to slide into, well, I'm busy in ministry. I'm doing a lot of this and I'm doing a lot of that. Friends, we need to be Locked onto the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. That's the hope for the church. We can't drift away. We can't let the culture guide us. We can't let the culture tell us what church is. We certainly can't let them tell us what the message of hope is, can we? Let's recalculate. Let's fix our eyes upon Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, thank you for this church. May it remain fixed upon the hope of the gospel Lord, lock them in to the truth. Thank you for faithful preaching that goes on here. Lord, I pray that they would rise up and continue to be the church that is a beacon in a church culture that is drifting further and further away from the hope of Jesus Christ. Lord, encourage your church today. Lord, I pray for the person here today who may be on a church roll, maybe they've been baptized. Maybe they know a lot about Jesus. But Father, they have drifted away. They are neglecting to believe the gospel, to repent upon their sin and believe upon Christ. I pray today, God, you have your way in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.